लैपटॉप का स्क्रीन थोड़ा डाउन कीजिए थोड़ा डाउन सो मैक्सिमम एंगल दैट इट इज बेंडिंग प्रॉबली आई शुड रेज द चेयर का हाइट नाउ टू इंक्रीज द हाइट ऑफ द चेयर I am unable to increase the height of the chair. Okay, sir. Fine then. Okay, sir. So five minutes left. Okay, my voice is clear.
sir within 10 second webinar is going to live okay okay so three two one sir we are live over to you sir thank you thank you good evening ladies and gentlemen nice to be you here with you today on a topic which is very very vital to the cardiovascular system management namely beta blockers beta blockers once used only for hypertension migraine and tremors was a much feared molecule because of its effect on suppressing the heart contractility and the bradycardia there was a time where we used to fear and when patient went into heart failure we would stop beta blockers we would reduce the dose we would stop the beta blockers before any surgery major surgery with the fear that the cardiac uh, suppression would be detrimental to the individual this entire usage of beta blockers has taken a 365 turn and uh, we are today using beta blockers as a main stay for management of heart failure let us see how today the evidence to clinical care journey was taken up by beta blockers we start with heart failure heart failure is a pathophysiological state as we all know where the heart is unable to pump blood at a rate commensurate with the requirement of the metabolizing tissue and so and can only do this with elevated filling pressures heart failure is a huge global problem with 1 to 2% of the adult population suffering from heart failure today when age 70 and above is concerned almost 10% of the world population suffers from heart failure the number is huge almost 6 million people in usa suffer from heart failure and almost four times the amount 24 million all over the world the causes of heart failure are probably the entire spectrum of all the diseases that affect the heart commonest among them the coronary artery disease ultimately coronary artery disease as it travels from angina to infarction to heart enlargement to recurrent infarctions ultimately lands up with heart failure whether or with or without angioplasty or bypass surgery the end result is heart failure hypertension itself long standing hypertension especially when it is not properly controlled will ultimately land up with heart failure dilated cardiomyopathy is an important cause of heart failure valvular heart disease in our country itself is a huge population that lands up with heart failure arrhythmias peripartum drug usage like use of cardiotoxic drugs namely for chemotherapy infections inflammations congenital heart disease ultimately lead to heart failure and there are various other radiopathic causes for heart failure the cause for which we cannot pinpoint the stages of heart failure is stage a where a person is high risk for heart failure doesn't have any symptoms stage b where he has a structural heart disease but no symptoms as yet stage c where he has a structural disease and a previous history of heart failure or a currently in heart failure symptoms and stage d is a end stage heart failure which is refractory to symptoms refractory to management it has symptoms and signs even at rest and requires special intervention apart from medical therapy device therapy or support of cardiac transplant so these four stages are almost equivalent or similar to the nyha class where stage b is equivalent to class 1 stage c would be a nyha class 2 or 3 depending on the severity of the symptom and stage d would be equivalent to class 
heart failure or NYHF class four. So heart disease is a common, costly and a deadly disease. Prevention, diagnosis and risk stratification, monitoring of these patients and managing heart failure is a big challenge. There have been great interest in the clinical role of biomarkers in heart failure, which are being studied and evolved over a period of time. But even in, in our country, heart failure is a huge problem and it is responsible for a big mortality of 20 to 30% in hospital and a 20 to 30% in a few months after discharge from the hospital. So that makes it a very deadly disease. The adherence to therapy is also very poor. And what is unique in our country is that the disease presents itself a decade earlier than in the Western population, where the mean age for disease presentation of heart failure is 72 years in the Western population. It is in the range of 56 to 61 years in our Indian population in various studies that have been done. Again, in a country also, we have almost 1% individuals suffering from heart failure. And as I said, the disease is deadly. The disease is very malignant and therefore has a survival period, which is almost as bad as malignancy and in certain condition worse than certain malignancies like prostate and breast cancer, which are relatively a better prognosis and a management can be managed properly. If you take an average Western population person from Europe or America at the age of 60, a male at the age of 60 without diabetes, he has on an average 20 years of healthy life after the age of 60. Once he has coronary artery disease, the life expectancy further reduces to 12.6 years. If he has an MI and a damage, significant damage to the myocardium, his life expectancy is reduced to 10, 11 years. If he has a stroke after the age of 60, his life expectancy further is six, seven to eight years. Now the same patient having gone into congestive heart failure at the age of 60 or above has only four years of a quality life to follow. Therefore, it is a relatively a malignant condition. Heart failure has been conventionally described as heart failure with reserved ejection fraction, HEPREF, and heart failure with preserved ejection fra fraction, HEPPEF. Earlier, there were only two groups, and of late, we describe heart failure with preserved ejection fraction at those above with an ejection fraction of more than 50. Those in the mid range are qualified with the ejection fraction of 40 to 50 are qualified as mid range heart failure. And those with a reduced ejection fraction of less than 40 or sometimes less than 35 are considered as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The purpose of this division is the difference in the management and difference in the way medications help in these different groups. What is changing in the last decade is more and more patients of heart failure are being hospitalized and they are found to have an ejection fraction more than 40%, which means they are heart failure with preserved ejection fraction those with mid-range and preserved ejection fraction contribute almost 65% of the patients admitted to the hospital in 2020. Heart failure is not a static condition. It is not a stable condition. It is a progressively worsening state. And every hospitalization results in worsening of the cardiac status resulting in reduction in the cardiac functions as well as the renal functions. Every admission makes the person go downhill and land up with the mortality and worsening morbidity. So the target of management heart failure is to treat it early before things go out of hand 
and progressive damage to the heart muscle makes the damage irreversible. <clears throat> Being able to predict who are prone to heart failure is an important advantage. The various factors from where we can decide or understand the probability of going into heart failure. H2, a heavy individual with body mass more than 30 kilogram per meter square. Hypertensives are more prone towards heart failure. Each of these factors are given points. Heavy individual given two points. Hypertensive given one point. Presence of atrial fibrillation given three points. High pulmonary hypertension, one point. Elderly person, age more than 60, would be one point. Increased filling pressure, which is predicted from the Doppler echocardiography, E to E prime of more than nine, is given one point. Now, all this score is added up, and from the score or the sum of the points that a person holds will tell you whether he's probability of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is low, mid-range, or whether it is very, very high. So we get some idea about the prediction or some idea about the probability of an individual going into heart failure. Of course, echocardiography, as you are all aware, is an important method of assessing heart functions, especially for reduced ejection fraction, as well as for preserved ejection fraction. In this echocardiography, again, global longitudinal strain pattern has become an important early markers that predicts worsening of heart functions and therefore increased probability of going from class A to class B, stage A to stage B of heart failure. And as we know, almost 33% of the patients who have sudden cardiac death are belonging to just class two of heart failure and not class three or class four. So even early symptomatic patients of heart failure are at a really big risk as far as mortality is concerned. Now the goals of treatment in heart failure include improving the survival definitely, decreasing the morbidity, increasing the exercise capacity, improving the quality of life, neurohormonal changes which can help prevent progressive damage to the heart muscle and the reshaping of the heart, progression of the congestive heart failure and decreasing the symptoms are some of the aims of management of heart failure. Let us see how beta blockers play a role in the management of heart failure. Beta blockers, as we know, the thought about beta blockers came in because activation of the sympathetic nervous system is a very important contributive factor in the pathophysiology of heart failure. Beta blockers, we know from the mechanism of its action, prevent stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system by inhibiting the action of catecholamines, namely noradrenaline and adrenaline at the beta adrenergic receptor. The other mechanisms involved in anti-heart failure functions of beta blocker is producing bradycardia, which prolongs the diastolic coronary filling, anti ischemic effect of beta blockers, decreasing the oxygen requirement of the heart, anti-arrhythmic benefits of the beta blockers, reducing sudden cardiac deaths, inhibition of the catecholamine induced necrosis and apoptosis of the heart muscle, upregulation of beta-1 receptors, inhibition of the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system also plays an important role, and increase in the atrial natriuretic factor are some of the well-understood mechanism by which beta blockers work. The principle is not to flog the donkey, but make it move slowly because it is already fatigued, the heart muscle is already weak, and already there is heart enlargement, there is already hypertrophy, which is beyond the capacity of improving further ejection fraction. It is to limit this donkey speed and thus save the heart energy. Important among beta blockers that we have 
understood benefit heart failure are metoprolol, bisoprolol, and carbidolol. Here again, the mechanism by which the contractility reduces in heart failure, there is a structural and functional modification in the myocardium produced by the beta blockers. The ventricular modeling in heart failure is also reversed by beta blockers and apoptosis, necrosis, fibrosis, hypertrophy, all of them get inhibited by beta blocker. Beta 1 activity of the beta blockers work on the heart, reducing the heart rate, the contractility and the conduction. The beta 1 activity on the kidneys decrease the renin release from the kidneys juxtaglomerular cells, decreasing the RAS activity. And the third benefit is for selective beta blockers. Uh, the beta blockers with uh, vasodilator activity, the third generation beta blockers like carvedilol and nebivalol, which have also in addition alpha-1 adrenergic receptor blockage, and they also increase nitrous oxide availability. By all these three methods, beta-1, vasodilatory mechanisms, there is a benefit on the cardiovascular system, decrease in the blood pressure, decrease in the oxygen demand, decrease in water and salt retention, decrease in oxidative stress and inflammatory stress, attenuation of the cardiovascular remodeling. This, in short, is the various methods by which beta blockers work. And this has been shown beyond doubt in various trials which have been conducted in the last few decades. The CIBIS-2 trial with, uh, with uh, bisoprolol showed compared to placebos are almost 34% reduction in the mortality where bisoprolol was used. As far as merit HF trial, here, metoprolol sustained release succinate form was used, again showing around 34% reduction in the mortality. And where Copernicus trial, where carvedilol was used, showed a reduction in ejection fraction, reduction in the mortality again in the similar range of 35%. And therefore, all these three trials have given us a very, very statistically strong support favoring they are used in heart failure. Bisoprolol initially started with a small dose in these trials when 0.25 milligram is progressively increased to the maximum tolerated dose. And the aim is to reach a 10 milligram once daily dose in this CIBIS trial. Bisoprolol is a beta-1 selective beta blocker. Carvedilol was started in a dose of 3.125 milligram twice a day increase the dose every few weeks till you reach a dose of 25 milligram twice a day. This has non-selective action on beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1 receptors. Metoprolol succinate and not the metoprolol tartrate was found to be definitely beneficial in heart failure and one of the first few drugs to be used, so beta blockers to be used started in a small dose of 12.5 milligram daily, increased to a maximum dose of 200 milligram once, once a day in this trial, the MERIT HF trial. Again, being beta-1 selective, could be used in most patients, but was slightly difficult to reach the full dose in patients of asthma or COPD. So here again, discussing a little more about metoprolol in heart failure. First drug to be studied in 1993. It showed reduced mortality in the range of 34%. And there was a marked reduction in transplant incidence also to the extent of 34% compared to placebo. While hospitalization was also reduced in heart failure to the extent of 35%. There was almost a 49% decrease in the sudden death or progressive death due to heart failure 
so a great benefit in sudden cardiac death as well so beyond doubt metoprolol was very very useful now it has to be understood that all beta blockers do not have the same anti failure properties so all beta blockers are not equal as far as management of heart failure is concerned and this was found in the use of various other beta, uh, beta blockers like bucinolol nebulol also did not show a really remarkable significant reduction in mortality bisoprolol carvedilol and metoprolol are the ones which shows around 35% reduction in mortality morbidity here is a list of various trials which have been done with various beta blockers and the benefits have been in that range of 35% again here comparing the various trials the among them the senior trial was done with nebulol we shall discuss a little bit more about the senior trial later this was a beta blocker in heart failure collaborative group which pulled together various trials studied over a period of last few decades and they pulled around 8637 heart failure patients in various randomized controlled trials in order to analyze as to which type of patients benefited from heart failure management with these drugs and what were the shortcomings and why were they being used less often in the elderly and in the women population so as we know beta blockers is a class 1a recommendation for symptomatic heart failure due to reduced ejection fraction its concomitant use in atrial fibrillation was analyzed in this group the clinical concern was that it is being sub optimally utilized or under utilized in certain groups notably in women and in the elderly more over there was a theoretical concern about altered pharmacokinetics in the elderly patients and the dose in these patients would be to a lesser extent compared to the other younger patients and also whether they would tolerate it with equal ease as the younger population does so the questions which were to be answered with this collaborative study was what was the effect of beta blockers in heart failure across the spectrum of left ventricular ejection fraction when it comes to do left ventricular ef of less than 40 or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction there was no doubt about the utility of beta blockers but the question between 40 to 49 and above 50 was to be studied now there are very few randomized controlled trial which have studied this mid range ejection fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction here is a graph which shows you that beta blockers whether used at the age of 50 or 60 or 70 or 75 whatever the age the benefits in the mortality morbidity are more or less same and therefore elderly people just because of the age should not be deprived of beta blockers now effect of beta blockers on all cause mortality in the group which had an ejection fraction less than 40% but were in sinus rhythm there was a remarkable benefit with beta blockers a reduction in mortality all cause mortality even in the group in mid range ejection fraction of 40 to 49 but in sinus rhythm there was a significant statistically significant reduction in the mortality and morbidity now however the group of patients with lvef with preserved ejection fraction did not see any benefit as far as all cause mortality reduction is concerned with the beta blockers now what happens to the ef the ejection fraction seen at the baseline showed a difference the baseline ejection fraction 
increased at the end of one year and it increased consistently whether the EF at the baseline was 20% or 25% or 30% or 35% or 40%. Up to 49%, there was a remarkable improvement in ejection fraction in these patients. But in patients who had an EF of more than 50 or 50 at the baseline did not show any significant increase in the EF. So changes in EF also were studied in this, analyzed in the, not studied, they were analyzed in this uh, collaborative study, whether they were in sinus rhythm or in atrial fibrillation. Well, EF did improve in patients who had sinus rhythm. They did improve in patients who had atrial fibrillation, but the mortality only improved when they were in sinus rhythm. The mortality did not improve when they were in atrial fibrillation. So differentiating whether beta blockers should be used with confidence in patients with have sinus rhythm because of the consistent reduction in the mortality and the benefits and absence of this benefit in atrial fibrillation. And that is why the indications do not normally process or advise use of beta blockers when patient is in atrial fibrillation unless for some other reason. Now efficacy of beta blockers according to gender, all cause mortality, whether it was men or whether it was women was benefited equally when compared in these trials. Heart failure hospitalizations also benefited equally male members of heart failure and female members of heart failure when compared between themselves and they were statistically consistent. So summarizing beta blockers improve heart failure and reduce cardiovascular mortality in patients who are in sinus rhythm especially when then I have an EF of less than 40 or even in the group where they have an EF of 40 to 49 percent. Beta blockers, patients with heart failure with EF of more than 50 were very few in the various randomized controlled trials that were compared and there was a disconnect in patients of atrial fibrillation where beta blocker benefit was not consistent. So analysis of this beta blocker meta heart failure collaborative study was concerned. Answered a question that the elderly also should be given beta blockers without fear or phobia. They also benefit equally with beta blockers when they have heart failure especially when they are in sinus rhythm, especially when they have reduced ejection fraction. And they tolerate the beta blockers also fairly well. The results also perform, reinforce the use of beta blockers in male and female patients equally. So we have a chart here to tell us as to what area of the ischemic heart disease spectrum are beta blockers useful? Beyond doubt, they must be used in patients of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Beyond doubt, they should be used in patients of post-MI. Various trials have shown us that they protect the myocardium, they reduce the arrhythmogenicity, they reduce sudden cardiac death, they improve the remodeling of the heart muscle in the post-MI period. They are useful for various arrhythmias, especially in the post-MI period. And certain studies have shown that even beyond one year, they are also useful. By themselves, for only arrhythmias, they are useful. They may be level B for indication for beta blockers. Unstable angina, they are useful. Acute phase, prolonged phase after MI, they are useful. Hypertensives can be used selectively. Their role has gone down as far as the uh, preference is concerned. 
So all beta blockers are not the same. All beta blockers do not have the same indications. When it comes to MI, metoprolol and carbidolol are preferred. When it comes to ischemic heart disease management, all the beta blockers more or less are equally good. When it comes to heart failure, we said metoprolol, carvidolol, and bisoprolol are definitely the best beta blockers. To a certain extent, nebicolol also reduces hospitalization as far as heart failure is concerned, but has not shown a very good statistically mortality reduction. Similarly, other indications in diabetes, you have to be careful as regular beta blockers, metoprolol and uh, bisoprolol would worsen the metabolic state, would increase the blood sugars, would increase the triglycerides. Therefore, in these conditions, you would prefer to use carvidolol or nebulol, which have the alpha-1 receptor blockage activities and the vasodilator benefits. In COPD, again, you would prefer using nebulol or a reduced dose of bisoprolol rather than metoprolol and carvidolol, which do induce bronchospasm being non-selective. Various AHA and ACC guidelines give one A indication for LVF, ischemic heart disease, ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI, all of them one A indication as far as use of beta blockers is concerned. In those with EF, more than 40% with or without heart failure, even without heart failure, they have a 2A indication, which means that they are can be used and do have a beneficial benefit. Now, here is a stage B heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. All patient post-MI would have a 1B indication for use of beta blockers to reduce mortality. All patients who do not have MI, but are in heart failure and asymptomatic stage B, as we said, would have a 1C indication for the use of beta blocker. In heart failure stage three, with reduced ejection fraction, definitely one of the three beta blockers should be used in all patients recommended and should be, the dose should be maximized as per the trial in order to achieve the maximum benefit unless beta blockers are contraindicated in these patients. In stage C recommendation, the use of beta blocker, AC inhibitor in ARB with hypertension is reasonable. This is, we are talking about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Here, Beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs should be used for management of hypertension. And this would be reasonable to control the blood pressure in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in order to prevent recurrences. Though strong evidence to favor them is not available as far as reduction in mortality is concerned, but they do help manage the hypertension and the LV function to a certain extent from worsening. As far as patients who are hospitalized with heart failure, initiation of the beta blocker is recommended after optimization of the volume status and successfully discontinuing intravenous diuretic, vasodilator, or inotropes once the patient is stable, not in very gross fluid overload, not in hypotensive state. Beta blockers should be initiated before patients go home preferably in a low dose and only the stable patients or else they should be added later on on follow-up. Caution should be used in initiative of beta blockers in patients who have required inotropes during their hospital stay and the indication here also remains 1B but with all caution. So various guidelines as far as heart failure management is concerned over the last whole decade have strongly recommended use of beta blockers. And beta blockers 
rightly benefit patients whether they are in nyha functional class 2 class 3 class 4 whether they are ischemic lv dysfunction or non ischemic lv dysfunction all of them do benefit from beta blockers here is a big study as we said the senior study where used nebulol for patients of who are in the seniors above the age of 70 and here again the outcomes were favorable in favor of beta blockers in favor of uh, use of beta blockers whether similar to those seen with uh, misoprolol metoprolol and carvedilol however the benefit was all cause mortality and cv hospitalization put together when treated with nebulol showed a 27% reduction which was statistically significant so in patients where you would not be able to use beta 1 or beta blockers otherwise because of copd because of asthma because of peripheral vascular disease or because of metabolic causes nebulol we said had a vasodilatory benefits as lesser side effects as far as the lungs are concerned and therefore were better tolerated in these patients you could prefer this drug for the purpose you need to keep in mind the various side effects of beta blockers namely bradycardia heart block worsening of heart failure you need to monitor the heart rate increase in blood sugars may happen in patients who are prone towards diabetes sexual dysfunction or impotency is known rebound hypertension unstable angina myocardial infarction when there is an abrupt cessation of beta blockers for some reason in certain specific groups there might be drowsiness dizziness depression non selective beta blockers may cause bronchospasm as we discussed and non iso agents may increase triglycerides so they are metabolically not very friendly and therefore you need to be watching the various metabolic parameters when putting on these beta blockers here is a small comparison between beta blockers in heart failure where metoprolol and carvedilol and bisoprolol were studied and there was a statistically significant higher benefit with carvedilol noticed in this comparison carvedilol also we have to realize has to be progressively increased in dose in order to achieve the target dose as done in the trials of 25 mg bid to get the optimum benefit so concluding our discussion on beta blockers beta blockers are currently the cornerstone of heart failure up titrating to the maximum dose should be undertaken with lot of care and with persistent the three beta blockers beyond doubt are currently approved for heart failure beta block uh, for management of heart failure use of beta blockers in current studies or clinical studies have shown a mortality benefit of 35% hospital reduction in admissions of around 35% and it becomes a standard form of therapy in heart failure heart failure beta sorry beta blockers in heart failure take a very center stage and show a very very prominent significant reduction in mortality morbidity the other drugs which come near it and form the other pillars of management of heart failure are secubital valsartan and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist and of late sglt2 inhibitors the number needed to treat would be 30 in case of simvastatin would be 20 56 in case of ramipril and would be in the range of 21 as far as metoprolol in increasing the life is concerned by a year so ace inhibitors namely ace arbs and rna have a class 1a indication beta blockers have class 1a indication 
MR interphonists have also a class one indication. Now, you can start with one drug, but you have to rapidly add the second drug. If you start with AC inhibitor ARBs, then you have to add beta blockers rapidly because they have an added benefit and additional benefit as far as when combined together. So ACE, ARBs and beta blockers, sorry, not ACE, either ACE or ARBs or RNE, along with beta blockers and MR antagonists would have the maximum mortality reducing benefit up to the extent of almost 63%. And this benefit should be achieved. Various studies show the pattern of use of various drugs in heart failure. The maximum used drug is loop diuretic, which does not alter the course of the disease, but definitely produces symptomatic benefit. Next in line are ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, statins, antidiabetics, ARBs. We have not uh, mentioned here SGLT2 inhibitors and RNA, but more and more patients are now getting the benefit of these drugs and progressively more and more mortality benefit is being achieved. I would be glad to answer any questions if there are any in the question box. I don't see the question box here, chat box down here. Okay. We have Dr. Monica Goel here saying which beta blocker you prefer in your clinical practice for heart failure? Well, uh, no one preference really. I probably equally use carvedilol, metoprolol, namely the succinate, as well as the bisoprolol. Somehow bisoprolol is relatively easy to use because you don't need to progressively titrate the dose. It's relatively two-step titration. But again, in post-MI, carvedilol is what I prefer. Metoprolol for the post-MI period and all heart failure. Equally, as I said, equally we use various type of beta blockers. We have Dr. Swapnel. How is the usage of beta blockers in young ACS patients? Well, across the entire spectrum of disease of ischemic heart disease, we do use beta blockers for various stages. Angina management, unstable, stable, post MI. However, the usage or the requirement to manage uh, angina has, the drug requirement has gone down relatively because of the intervention of angioplasty and bypass surgeries, but still they hold an important role as far as management of ischemic heart disease, ACS patients is concerned in the acute as well as in the long term. We have Dr. Manisha Bhatt here. Which combination do you prefer with beta blockers in heart failure with diabetes patient? Well, uh, as we said, beta blockers do metabolically affect the patients. They do increase weight. They do alter your sugars. They increase your triglycerides. So those which are metabolically relatively safe, like carvedilol, you would prefer those compared to the other beta blockers. Swapnel latest ESE 2020 guidelines have said that metoprolol reduces mortality by 40%. What are your views? Well, all the trials related to metoprolol have shown a reduction to the similar extent uh, as far as the mortality is concerned. So I would agree 35, 40% is the range where the benefits have been noted. Well, I see that is the all the questions which have been asked in the chat box. When you start beta blockers at what dose at the beginning? Well, uh, generally 
we start them on a smaller dose especially when you have an acute recent infarct or a recent uh, heart failure patient is fluid overloaded we make him little dry then under observation start him on a small dose even if it has to be a tiny dose because of the blood pressure permitting only use of half tablet of carbidolol 3.1 to 5 bd well you have a possibility of increasing the dose the next day and the next day wait every 2 3 days you can increase the dose and titrate the dose as per your optimum dose required going by the pulse going by the blood pressure going by the clinical uh, fluid overload of the patient you will decide on the how rapidly you would increase the dose any other questions any other queries feel free to ask or okay sir so shall we wait for few minutes for more questions sure sure okay sir fine see the newer drug are promoted by the pharmaceutical companies in a big bang way whether it is rni whether it is sglt2 inhibitors whether it is the device companies which market the crts or the icds but the poor beta blockers gets left behind so we must not ignore these poor beta blockers and where patients cannot afford the drugs or the high end drugs or the latest drugs beta blockers come in very handy and should not be ignored definitely all the drugs which help heart failure all the different groups of drugs which help heart failure should be utilized because as i said heart failure doesn't give you a second chance once diagnosed as heart failure once the ejection fraction is already 35% there will be progressive worsening damage recurrent admission a very expensive procedure repeated hospitalization to the icu it is better to use all the drugs the patient tolerates from various groups starting from ace inhibitors or rni if he is not affording you can use ace inhibitors but of course rni is shown to have double the benefit as compared to ace inhibitors arb is concerned arbs have a 12% reduction in mortality ace inhibitors have 16% reduction in mortality rni has a 36% reduction in mortality beta blockers have almost 35 to 40% reduction in mortality mr antagonists are also the latest and the good drug very simple to use single tablet epilirinone 25 mg may reduce mortality by almost 25 30% sglt2 inhibitors simple one step drug dapagliflozin or amphagliflozin in a fixed dose of 10 mg with or without diabetes would reduce your mortality by almost 22% 30% they reduce not only the cardiovascular mortality they reduce your renal damage ckd dapa ckd showed a 50% reduction in the hard point as far as kidney failure is concerned so i am sure you realize that this is a common disease the heart the kidney the metabolic diabetic all of them have a similar and they go with each other worsening each other and responsible for the mortality is cardiorenal which dose of nebivalol would you use in copd nebivalol can be used fairly safely in copd if you are hesitant if there is an active bronchospasm you may start with a small dose but in my experience we can use 5 mg very safely sometimes we can use 5 mg twice a day very safely that is the maximum dose permissible and required to have a full beta blockade sometimes 5 mg per day is enough to produce a good amount of beta blockade you will realize that the pulse rate remains around 60 the bp is okay and there is no need to increase the dose further in asthma it is more challenging there also we can use nebivalol in smaller doses but 
in COPD, definitely we can use nebulol fairly safely. How do you diagnose heart failure? Well, heart failure is diagnosed clinically by the patient's symptoms of breathlessness, easy fatigability, raised JVP, edema, feet, liver enlarged clinically, and then by various supportive diagnosis of ECG, X-ray chest, echocardiography. These tell you about the underlying structural disease which is responsible for the heart failure. The EF can be evaluated, the LA size, the LV hypertrophy, the LV enlargement, the right heart enlargement, the pulmonary hypertension, all of them point towards heart failure. Biomarkers in the form of uh, BNP, pro-BNP, definitely gives you a diagnosis of heart failure in patients which are borderline. You have an obese diabetic who comes with breathlessness. You don't know whether breathlessness is because of his obesity or because he's deconditioned or because of his lung condition. Do a BNP or a pro anti-pro-BNP. If it is high, definitely it is early heart failure. That's a way to pick up early heart failure. And uh, I believe that's why how you diagnose heart failure. Now, if you ask me how to diagnose uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, well, most of the patients are have a background of hypertension. They are diabetics. They have left ventricular hypertrophy and echocardiography. They have prior coronary artery disease. All of them may have an EF of more than 50, but still can go into heart failure. It's a clinical presentation of breathlessness with which they present. There you find that they have developed RALS. There you find out that they have tachycardia, or there you find out they have gone into atrial fibrillation with failure, or there you find out that their BNP is raised, anti-pro BNP is raised. From these clinical settings and the biomarkers and the X-ray chest and the echocardiography, you would pick up even uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. As we said, the incidence of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction seems to be on the rise more rapidly than those without redu with reduced ejection fraction. It's very easy to diagnose those with reduced ejection fraction, but to diagnose those without reduced ejection fraction is a little bit of a challenge unless you really carefully evaluate the signs, symptoms, biomarkers, and echocardiography. Echo in these patients is generally LV hypertrophy, dilated LA, pulmonary hypertension in the acute phase, E to A ratio as far as the increased filling pressure is concerned and echocardiography is the way to diagnose. Can SGLT2 be given, SGLT2 inhibitors be given in a patient at the age of 70? Yes, certainly they can be given. Your indication, as in our reference to what we are discussing today, it is with heart failure. Yes, today SGLT2 inhibitors has become one A indication for management of heart failure with or without diabetes. So patient is in heart failure, not in the acute decompensated state, not in a very sick condition, hospitalized for acute failure. Once he is stable, you can add SGLT2 inhibitors, even if his age is 70, that is no bar. The benefits are going to be good almost as good as mineralocorticoid receptor blockades, almost as good as ACE inhibitor, almost as good as, or nearly as good as beta blockers. Especially there would be patients where you cannot use beta blockers because of other reasons. He already has bradycardia. He already has a sick sinus syndrome. He already has second degree AV block. Those are the patients where you cannot use beta blockers. You have to depend on the other drugs. RNA, MR antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors. Which drug of choice among beta blockers in young hypertensives? Well, uh, 
Are we talking about general beta blockers in young individuals, hypertensives only? Those with vasodilator benefits, as far as carvedilol, nebulol is concerned, would be preferred. They have lesser metabolic uh, problems. They have later importancy, lesser importancy as a problem, especially with nebulol and carvedilol. And uh, misoprolol also is very one, very selective beta one blocker and used in uh, has a lesser incidence of importance here, the side effects. As I said, the noise is being made by the newer drugs, but we tend to forget the older drugs and we tend to underuse the older drugs, especially underdose the older drugs, we must dare and increase the dose of beta blockers. Don't panic if the bradycardia happens. It is the effect which helps the heart. So getting a bradycardia of 50, 55 is desirable rather than a side effect of beta blocker. Okay. And if you make a patient walk, you'll realize that his pulse goes up to 70, 75 within a minute, within two minutes. So it is not that it is a bradycardia which will be harmful to him. If he has a persistent pulse of 50 also, it is okay. The lesser it is, the less burden, the less ischemia, the less strain on the heart, which is already weak. Any more questions? It is 6.56. We give you four more minutes to ask any other questions after which we close the session, I believe. Here is a question by Dr. Swapnil. Latest ESC guidelines have said that metoprolol reduces. No, that's okay. That's a older question. Sorry. Dr. Pradeep is glad that he attended this webinar. It was informative. Well, I'm sorry. It was hodgepodge as far as putting the facts is concerned because it's a huge, huge topic, the beta blockers in heart failure. The doctors who dared to use beta blockers in Sweden for heart failure did it very hidingly without the consent of their department. And uh, they almost lost their job, but they used in really critically ill patients during emergencies and found that it is helping those patients when in gross heart failure and their survival is improving. That's how the story of beta blocker in heart failure started in Sweden. Okay, sir. So I think there are no further questions. So shall we wait or wind up? I think we wind up, Purvi. Thank you for being there with us and helping us conduct this webinar so smoothly. Okay, sir. So on behalf of the organizer, we would like to thank you so much for your insightful and educative talk, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, good night to you. Okay, sir. From here, I'm ending the session now. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you.